Alex Jones, a controversial figure that many love to hate. We've already spoken about him before, but what about his news company, InfoWars? How do they function as an operation, make their money, and promote their conspiracy theories? Today, we're going to try to peer behind the InfoWars curtain and briefly look past the host, Jones, to see who they are as a company. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about InfoWars. I highly recommend checking out my previous Alex Jones episode for some more context. Plus, if you're wondering why I don't critique Alex Jones himself often in this episode, that's why. There will be some overlap today as we discuss how InfoWars was founded. However, InfoWars as a company and quote, news station is an episode on its own. So obviously here we are, let's get into it. Alex Jones has a lengthy history with radio and television, but by the time 1999 rolled around, he'd actually been fired for this language about tragic events being inside jobs. Alex Jones has a loyal fan base as he'd had his own show on KJFK and was somewhat of a folk hero to Austin residents. So they followed him to his website, infowars.com. There, Alex Jones was able to broadcast to 10 stations across the country thanks to an ISDN line he installed at home. For better or worse, Alex Jones and InfoWars is in many ways, a model for people to create their own media and their own platform. But what is this platform saying exactly? As InfoWars becomes both more controversial and more popular in recent years, more people have been asking that exact question. So let's begin by taking a look at how InfoWars operates during a day-to-day news cycle. In an interview with NBC, Alex Jones himself says that there is actually no script at InfoWars. He simply looks at an article and then just discusses it. Interviewer Megan Kelly criticized him for this and refers to it as a garbage in, garbage out method. 95% of what we cover is looking at a news article and then you know uh, discussing it. Well, but you know, if you just look at an article and discuss it, it's garbage in, garbage out, right? If you have- So long as Alex Jones is not properly vetting his sources, backing them up and things of that nature. Owen Schroyer, host of the InfoWars show War Room, says that he decides what he's going to cover. He rarely receives direction from Alex Jones and the show is pretty much left up to him. When asked if he considers himself a journalist, Owen says he's just a human that wants to find the truth. Rather than take a look at the many clips or even short form videos on InfoWars website, I decided to watch an entire two and a half hour long InfoWars program to see it for myself in its entirety and how the daily news at InfoWars actually looks. Although I watched a documentary created in part by Alex Jones for the previous episode that was about him, it only seemed fair to give his news show a full and complete context. I watched their full show from January 10th, 2022. So let's break it down. They start by reporting that Dr. Robert Malone was banned from Twitter shortly before appearing on the Joe Rogan podcast, which they claim has 11 times more influence than CNN. Dr. Malone is a virologist and immunologist who claims to have created the mRNA technology behind COVID vaccines. And he argues that people have been hypnotized into believing mainstream ideas around COVID. Other scientists have argued that hundreds contributed to research into mRNA tech. Malone certainly did not do this without help. However, anti-vax or vax skeptic media seems keen on calling him the inventor of mRNA vaccines as it sounds far more compelling. As The Atlantic puts it, Malone has been drawn to hosts that won't question if he's the brains behind Pfizer or Moderna shots. Infowars and other fringe media sites won't quibble over credit and explain how science is a relay race. Instead, they're happy to address Malone by the title he wants, inventor of the mRNA vaccines. In their minds, it's a win-win. Malone has the title he believes he deserves and vaccine skeptic news sources have what appears to be a reputable source on their hands. But moving forward from here, the InfoWars program mentions how Americans have gained weight during lockdowns. And as recent studies show, overweight Americans are a higher risk from dying from COVID-19. InfoWars, by my interpretation and my opinion, seem to imply that the lockdown should have never happened for this very reason. Yet if the lockdown did not happen at all, far more Americans, such as those with compromised immune systems would have caught COVID and potentially more would have died. And I'll be quite frank, I don't understand the point they're trying to make here. Like the example with Malone, the problem isn't necessarily that InfoWars has told a black and white lie, at least in this episode, but that they've presented a small portion of truth when they interpret it without the bigger picture so that things get lost in translation. After this, InfoWars briefly touches on the Capitol riots and states that it never should have happened, but adds that the media grossly exaggerated the number of deaths. On January 6th, there was one death, which was Ashley Babbitt, a civilian that was shot by Capitol Police. It's true that Ashley Babbitt was the only one that died at the scene when she was shot in the shoulder after attempting to force her way into the House chamber where members of Congress were sheltering in place. 
However, InfoWars neglects to mention that four police officers who defended the Capitol took their own lives after the insurrection and the countless officers that were injured. They simply do not tell the whole story. Matt Weber filling in for host Harrison also discusses current events on the American Journal on InfoWars. About 17 minutes in, Matt says, we are just thinking out loud, which honestly seems like a pretty accurate description of the segment. As there are no experts with credentials being interviewed or sources to speak of, the show really does just come across as a thinking out loud kind of talking session. In fact, the only time that an article is even put on screen is to discuss a dystopian 1973 film called Soylent Green. Matt spends several minutes comparing today's world to the world in the movie, saying that impossible meat is like synthetic meat in Soylent Green. He also claims that the movie got overcrowding right and New York City isn't that far off from the 40 million that live there in the movie. And there are about 8.4 million people living in New York City at the moment for the record. So um, the number's just, just ever so slightly smaller than 40 million, but I digress. After this, the American Journal begins taking calls into the show and implies to their listeners that Bob Saget passed away from taking the booster vaccine shot. The title of the episode is called, Bob Saget Dies Suddenly, Took Booster Shot on November 28th. What they don't say directly, and their listeners do, several of them stating, how can you not connect the dots? There's a connection there and things of that nature. Infowars does not correct them. Sometime later, another fill-in host named Rob promotes their nascent iodine called Survival Shield X2. He claims to gargle with it or put it in a nasal rinse and also recommends vitamin mineral fusion, as well as a few other supplements that Infowars offers. Rob says that the sales of these products keep Infowars running. And though articles claim Alex Jones has made $150 million in three years, it costs $50 million a year to keep Infowars up and running, apparently. After promoting the supplements, Rob goes on to claim that the CDC is proving them right. It's true that the CDC director is struggling to get the message about COVID out there. As information is constantly changing, evolving, new variants emerge, and we learn more about COVID in general, she's had a hard time being consistent and clear. For example, saying that people are dying with COVID or of COVID are two very different things. And even minor slip ups can become major and change the narrative about COVID entirely. And I can agree that she should be more careful with her language. However, again, InfoWars does not present the whole story. Multiple times throughout the show, there are adverts for supplements, which seem like a conflict of interest, considering they're talking about the pandemic, staying safe and apocalyptic events. Although I don't want to bore you with summaries of all their episodes and I can't pick apart every word or conspiracy theory that's brought to light on their shows, let's take a look at how InfoWars operates as a company before we get into some of the harm that they've contributed to. InfoWars has failed on numerous occasions to back up anything they say with proof. Or what's arguably worse is that Jones has twisted the truth to suit his narrative, improperly representing a situation to fearmonger and perhaps even peddle a product. Not only is there a lack of evidence for his claims, but his products as well. So let's take a look at that, the health and wellness branch of InfoWars. As it turns out, a lot of InfoWars products share striking similarities with another health and wellness company we've discussed in previous episodes, Goop. While InfoWars has recommended their Silver Bullet product, Goop has recommended Colloidal Silver by the brand Higher Nature. Both supposedly contain a suspension of tiny silver particles in liquid which Goop claims to keep germs at bay and which InfoWars has claimed to be used to cure COVID. According to the US National Institute of Health, any actual benefit of taking colloidal silver is not supported by scientific evidence. And as silver can build up in the body's tissue, it can give your skin a blue-gray discoloration. It can also cause poor absorption of other drugs like antibiotics. The FDA sent a warning letter to Alex Jones for his claims, along with multiple other companies, telling them to stop marketing colloidal silver products as cures. Of course, this is just one of his products. Infowars also sells Wake Up America, an immune support coffee blend containing cordyceps mushroom used in traditional Chinese medicine. Again, substantial scientific evidence supporting this mushroom's use does not exist at this time. For Goop, Infowars, or anyone else who wants to present these supplement products as cure-alls is disingenuous at best and grossly irresponsible at worst. Infowars also sell maca, a root, in their super male vitality products, selenium supplements, and shilajit, a sticky substance from rocks primarily in the Himalayas, in their Z-Shield drops, all of which have extremely limited evidence to back up any health claims. Although I knew that Infowars sold questionable products, we tend to see clips of the show online, and it's not always clear how much of a moneymaker this actually is for them. And seriously, Infowars is a full-blown supplement company and a news source combined. They also have other Armageddon preparedness materials like water and air filtrations, freeze dryers, radios, survival gear, and other things of that nature. Not only is Alex and Infowars pitching these supplemental products that don't have any evidence to back them up, but one thing I find particularly interesting is that he's pitching them to fearful, vulnerable people. 
If his audience believes him and they bought into this narrative that the world is ending and the elite and government is out to get them, then it's especially shady to pitch them supplemental and Armageddon products. It's not a leap to say that there's a clear conflict of interest there. According to the New York Times in 2014, Jones's business had revenues of more than $20 million. What's made him a millionaire is the ability to merge his bizarre claims with his merchandise. The apocalypse requires products that the Infowar store provides. His customers buy in and they buy. It's not just the apocalypse and COVID products either, but even supposed fungal epidemics. Though these videos have been removed from YouTube, Vox claims that Jones and his associate, Edward Group, a naturopath, spoke about how most doctors and hospitals don't take the time to check people for fungal infections. Group claims that the fungus and yeast overgrowth can cause everything from brain tumors to skin conditions and obesity before pitching their solution, their supplement Myco ZX. In actuality, while strains of drug-resistant fungi are in fact a problem, Myco ZX is far from the solution. Plus, Group has implied that the medical community doesn't take it seriously, when judging by this article anyway, nothing could be further from the truth. Dr. Rhodes, an infectious disease specialist, says that resistant strains have been driven by the use of antifungicides on crops, and one study from the British government said that 10 million people could die from infections like these by 2050 if policies are not put into place to develop new medicines. InfoWars Supplements offers no genuine solution, and if anything, they're actually more likely to be dangerous to your health than helpful. Myco ZX and Caveman Paleo Formula, both sold by InfoWars, have both been found to contain lead. InfoWars was even sent on notice of violation of California Safe Drinking Water and Toxic Enforcement Act back in October, 2017, because of this very issue. While you won't find Myco ZX on his shop anymore, you can still find plenty of other InfoWars products on their site, and even Amazon too. Despite the warnings and unproven products, Jones makes a pretty penny from these and spends more of it on himself than he seems to want his audience to believe. As we mentioned earlier, one of Jones's employees, Rob, insists that everything they sell goes right back into the company. Jones himself has said the same thing, that it costs 45 to $50 million per year to run the company and implied that any money made from Infowars goes right back in. However, Jones still makes plenty, enough that he could donate $100,000 to Trump shortly before the insurrection. He purchased four Rolex watches in one day in 2014, a $40,000 saltwater aquarium, and he and his now ex-wife Kelly Jones once had almost $800,000 worth of silver, gold, and precious metals in a safe deposit box. According to an in-depth report from Spiegel International, about two thirds of Infowars funding comes from selling products on their shop page. There's nothing wrong with anyone from an influencer to a television program having their own product line. It's just the way that Infowars promotes it as a COVID cure or seemingly scaring their viewers into believing that they need these products and the lies that Joan tells them about where the money goes, that's especially misleading. New York Magazine has gone so far as to say that Infowars is a machine built to sell snake oil diet supplements, stating that it didn't always used to be like this either. When Alex Jones started Infowars, he sold DVDs, t-shirts, and subscriptions, putting in an estimated $10 million a year. It wasn't until late 2013 that Jones's business model changed completely and he began pushing supplements that sources state are designed to prey on the paranoid and insecurities of his listeners. Now, he hasn't made a documentary film for a decade and he doesn't push his video subscription service either. New York Magazine explains that this is by design. If he were a typical radio talk show host, Jones would have two main sources of revenue, syndication and ad revenue. However, Infowars is syndicated by GCN or Genesis Communications Network. Rather than charge syndication fees to radio stations, GCN uses the barter model, thereby offering the content for no cost and in exchange reserves the right to sell national advertising against the programs, generally four minutes per hour. GCN shows are picked up on hundreds of stations around the country, which then run their own local ads. From there, the host gets another three to four minutes of their own advertising time, the time that Jones uses for Infowars. Since he doesn't get syndication fees from GCN or a cut of the advertising that GCN sells, the radio show doesn't really need direct money for Jones. That's why he pushes his products so hard on his radio show. And that's why they take up many of the display ads on infowars.com. Alex Jones may be known for his right-wing views and for running Infowars, but he's a supplement mogul making about $165 million from September, 2015 to 2018. Now, a lot of the issues I have with the supplement industry itself are very well documented as I've talked about it many, many times before. So I'm not shocked that Alex Jones is doing this or that Infowars is essentially built on supplements, but it's all of the more reason that this industry needs better regulation. And this is just another example of that. It's no surprise that conspiracy theorists and snake oil salesmen would promote misinformation in other ways. Regulators are in a way complicit for letting someone like Alex Jones make money to spread his message. If the supposed snake oil and supplements in general were harder to sell, Infowars would be virtually broke. 
I'm sure they'd find something else to peddle and sell or another way to do it, but he wouldn't be making such easy money with these false claims or misleading claims if the industry was better regulated. And before we get into some of InfoWars experts, I'm just gonna take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. Today's episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. Now, I love that I can get basically everything online, but it's hard for me to keep track of promo codes, even when I've sacrificed my emails to the savings gods. But now I have Honey to help find them for me because Honey is the free shopping tool that searches the internet for promo codes and applies the best ones to your cart. Now, recently I was looking for some new oils for the candle company, but even this company used Honey and I saved like 10% on the candle oils. And I was like, hell yeah, are you kidding me? That's great. So it works with literally any industry. If you're shopping for clothing, for supplies, furniture, like you name it, it essentially is there for everything. And now Honey doesn't just work on your desktop, but it works on your iPhone too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. So if you don't already have Honey, you could just be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. So make sure you get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash casket. Again, that's joinhoney.com slash casket. It's January, so tis the season of changing habits. Doesn't matter if you're just saving money by eating takeout less, learning how to cook, never meal planning again, whatever is on your mind, HelloFresh is here to help. HelloFresh delivers pre-portioned ingredients right to your door, including farm fresh produce that arrives within a week. So you get convenience and quality. HelloFresh cuts back on time in the kitchen with meals ready in about 30 minutes or less, so you can spend it on working on your other New Year's resolutions. Plus, they also have their quick and easy meals, which I said multiple times over. I cannot get over those. I love just the easy to go little sandwiches and little flatbread pizzas you can make so fast. I'm in love with those, but they also have like those. They've got 20 minute recipes. They have a low prep and easy cleanup options too, which is just incredible. And if you don't want to forget dessert either, because HelloFresh can satisfy your sweet tooth with seasonal limited time goodies like Dunkaroo's cookie dough or vanilla delight cheesecake, which, you know, I'm just kind of hungry thinking about that now. And Dunkaroos, I haven't had those in years. So I'm very curious and I need to get my hands on those just to see what the business is. So if you want to get started with HelloFresh this year, make sure you go to hellofresh.com slash casket 16 and use code casket 16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. That's up to 16 free meals and three free gifts at hellofresh.com slash casket 16. Use code casket 16. So who exactly is selling these supplements? Who's backing them up with scientific evidence? Why, none other than their associate, Dr. Edward Group, of course. Group is a chiropractor, by the way, and given some of the claims we're about to hear him make, I'm not all that inclined to refer to him as a doctor. On multiple occasions, Group has been referred to as an MIT alum on InfoWars. Yet when Last Week Tonight ran a segment about InfoWars, they uncovered that not only did Group complete a non-certificate degree program at MIT, but he didn't have any undergraduate degree there whatsoever. MIT themselves told the television program that referring to Group as an alumnus would be inaccurate and misleading. On LinkedIn, Group still calls himself an MIT alum to this day and has multiple other colleges listed, such as Harvard and Southeastern Louisiana University. The degree he actually does hold is from Texas Chiropractic College, though he might appear legitimate when you look at all the certificates on his wall during almost any InfoWars video call. He's discussed a wide variety of topics on InfoWars, from implying that vaccines are linked to autism to health trends and supplements. However, Group isn't just invested in seeing InfoWars succeed as the in-house medical professional they have on hand, but he's also the founder and president of Houston-based Global Healing Center, a supplement manufacturer. InfoWars buys supplements from GHC, then private labels them as InfoWars brand. Now, if that isn't a massive conflict of interest, I don't know what is. Group is the medical voice of InfoWars. Obviously, he's going to agree with whatever Alex Jones decides to spew because it financially benefits him and his company. InfoWars is keeping GHC running and vice versa. So they kind of need each other. If InfoWars actually believed in their supplemental product, then why not have a medical professional aside from the one you buy the products from promote it? But it gets better. I decided to check out Global Healing Center to see where InfoWars gets its products exactly and get an idea for what group promotes. Not only do they sell parasite cleanses and $100 courses about self-healing that they claim are linked to literally treating cancer, but they have an affiliate program too. Now, let me be clear, because I understand there might be some confusion, but affiliate programs are not always MLMs because you can't necessarily build a downline with an affiliate program. It's the same kind of argument that a square can be a rectangle, but a rectangle cannot be a square, if, if that makes sense. But point is, in an MLM, you make money with recruitment instead of products and sales, and that doesn't seem to be the case here necessarily. 
However, I find it personally quite questionable when I see a supplement company without FDA proven products essentially telling anyone with a large audience that they can apply to and potentially join an affiliate or influencer program. In fact, not only is GHC not FDA approved, but the FDA has actually warned them in the past about misleading claims on their website. They sent a letter to Group in 2008 for claiming that his Virozap supplement could treat the avian flu and Group throughout the years has reacted by criticizing the FDA for enforcing guidelines on supplements. Group has also interviewed the film director of Urine Aid about the benefits of urotherapy, aka urine therapy. And again, I actually have an episode about that too. He's promoted supplements and given other various health advice on his YouTube channel too. Again, he's not qualified to give medical advice. And as an owner of a supplement company, it only seems natural that he's going to recommend supplements to his audience. He has an entire video about the number one thing he takes for immune health and links it back to his company in the description box. And again, to reiterate, there's nothing wrong with promoting a product you've made, especially if it's potentially something you're proud of. I've promoted my candles here before, but it's when it's a health product and the creator's testimony is the only medical testimony that's provided, that's a different story entirely. Candles are not medical. They are just beautiful and they smell nice. As for InfoWars promoting group's messages, the GHC staff says they don't believe Alex Jones has any legitimate ties to the wellness movement. One of them has stated, quote, I think he recognizes that the natural health industry is dominated by foolish, rich white men who prey on desperate, paranoid, uneducated people who don't know any better than to embrace the they're out to get you message blindly, end quote. In this way, one might say that the natural health industry and Alex Jones's viewers have a lot in common. Even those within GHC themselves, who you would think have a vested interest in their products being sold, are concerned that the efficacy of their products is being overstated. Though GHC has received a warning letter from the FDA years ago, they tend to use more cautious language these days. For example, as opposed to claiming that their products treat mental illnesses, GHC claims their supplements promote mental clarity, mental vitality, or a healthy emotional state instead. Although these are essentially the exact same product coming from the exact same company, InfoWars says that their nascent iodine is designed to help you fight back against globalists with one of nature's greatest essentials using a more direct approach, it seems. Though I have a little sympathy for those at GHC considering my issues with the supplement industry, members of their staff have spoken with Jezebel and claim to be in genuine fear for their jobs because of the relationship between Group and Alex Jones. On numerous occasions when Group appears on InfoWars, he brings the health claims up a notch, like saying how he knew a man that recently undertook a 140 day water fast to rid himself of all disease. In one appearance with Alex Jones, he said the following, "'I'm not the type of person to try to instill fear, doom, and gloom, but I am here warning everyone that this may be the most devastating flu season in the history of the world, because I've never seen such a possibly, potentially, I'm not even going to say possibly, slew of ingredients that are going to be injected into our moms, our dads, our grandparents. We're on the verge of seeing a massive shift in disease and sickness and possibly even death. Once again, Alex Jones and group have teamed up and taken advantage of a fear that they've instilled within their own viewers. Group has received a warning letter from the FDA about his products. He recommends products such as colloidal silver that the FDA regularly warns against. He has no medical degree from an accredited college aside from his chiropractic degree from Texas Chiropractic College. And the FDA has made routine visits to GHC from 2006 to 2016. They've issued minor citations such as not having written protocols for microbial contamination from sick or infected personnel in 2010. Not only is this a supplement company with unproven products, but they have a slew of misleading claims and sometimes questionable practices to boot. Some at the GHC company speculate that Group has political ambitions of his own, potentially leading him to want to be close to a source like InfoWars. One member of GHC told Jezebel that he's said multiple times he wants to run for office and he's using GHC to further that. However, one of the biggest problems with InfoWars isn't just that they're allied with a company Quack Watch list as questionable organization run by a man who promoted urine therapy, it's the way that they've promoted violence. Multiple sources have argued that InfoWars has incited violence by making statements such as President Biden will be removed from office one way or the other. Alex Jones has made far more outlandish and vulgar claims, also referring to President Biden as We will never back down to the satanic, pedophile, globalist, new world order. And their walking dead, reanimated corpse, Joe Biden. The day before the Capitol riot, InfoWars host Owen Schroyer spoke at Freedom Plaza and stated that Americans are ready to fight. And that quote, we're not exactly sure what that's going to look like, perhaps in a couple weeks, if we can't stop this certification of the fraudulent election, we are the new revolution. 
we are going to restore and we are going to save the Republic, end quote. On the day of the riot, he spoke in a similar manner saying that today we march for the Capitol because we have to let our congressmen and women know they stole the election, we know they stole it and we aren't going to accept it. Schroyer faces charges for disorderly conduct and entering a restricted area on Capitol grounds, though this is not the first time he's broken the law in this manner. In December, 2019, Schroyer was arrested for shouting during a House Judiciary Committee impeachment hearing. In that case, he agreed to do community service, but at the time of the Capitol riots in January, 2021, he hadn't completed any of the requirements. However, he's also not the only member of InfoWars to be in this position. InfoWars video editor, Samuel Montoya was arrested in April, 2021 on charges that included impeding passage through Capitol grounds. In addition to multiple InfoWars employees invading the Capitol, PBS has argued that Alex Jones himself has fueled these flames by promoting the conspiracy theory that the 2020 election was stolen. Leading up to the attacks, Alex Jones was a key member at the forefront of these false theories. On January 5th, a video posted on InfoWars showed Alex Jones speaking on Freedom Plaza as well, telling the crowd, We have only begun to resist the globalists. Both Alex Jones and his employee Schroyer have used charged language and made false claims about the 2020 election being stolen, thereby contributing to the violence of the Capitol. And while that may sound like a very bold claim to make, accusing them of contributing to such a horrific event, multiple sources have accused Alex Jones of helping draw crowds to Washington for that very day. The select committee to investigate the January 6th attack has even subpoenaed Jones, ordering him to produce fund records in an attempt to learn who organized, planned, paid for, and received funds related to the rallies that drew Trump supporters to Washington. Political operative Roger J. Stone Jr., who promoted attendance at the January 5th and 6th rallies and solicited support to pay for security on stopthesteal.org, as well as Alex Jones, received subpoenas in late 2021. So this news has broken quite recently, and there are far more likely more updates to come. However, not only is the committee struggling to get Alex Jones to comply, but Alex Jones is actually suing the special committee as well. He offered to provide written responses to questions to avoid his deposition subpoena and has told the committee he will assert his Fifth Amendment rights. Thus far, the committee has rejected the offer of written responses, but seems to be considering offering Jones immunity to gain his testimony. Because of lawsuits slowing down the process and making it harder for the committee to act, we'll have to wait and see what happens in this case. While this may be one of the most recent examples of Alex Jones and Infowars sparking violence, it is certainly not the only example. In November, 2016, Jones promoted the conspiracy of Pizzagate, insisting that Hillary Clinton and top associates trafficked children within a basement of a Washington DC pizza restaurant, Comet Ping Pong. Alex Jones used his platform Infowars to insist on numerous occasions that his audience needed to go investigate it for themselves and that something was going on. His exact words were, Now, I want to be clear, not everybody in the WikiLeaks is involved in this, clearly. You have to go investigate it for yourself, but I will warn you, uh, this story that's been the biggest thing on the internet for several weeks, Pizzagate, as it's called, is a rabbit hole that is horrifying to go down. Now, let's go ahead and go to the report. Pizzagate is real. The question is, how real is it? What is it? Something's going on. Something's being covered up. It needs to be investigated. You just call it fake news. These are real WikiLeaks. This is real stuff going on. Alex Jones directly then encouraged his viewers to look into it, and unfortunately, one of them did. Edgar Madison Welch fired an assault rifle inside the pizzeria in some misguided attempt to self-investigate the conspiracy theory. He later claimed that he'd been listening to Alex Jones and he liked the InfoWars shows. He shared Pizzagate videos with a friend and had fallen down the so-called rabbit hole. Sometime after the shooting, Alex Jones apologized to the Comet Ping Pong owner, James Alfantis, for his part in promoting this false conspiracy theory and made a statement that he regretted any negative impact his commentaries about Pizzagate had. While Alex Jones claimed the apology is because he thought it was the right thing to do, as it's rare for Alex Jones to actually make a public apology in the first place, sources have speculated that it was actually to avoid legal action from the Comet Ping Pong owner. Under Texas law, Alex Jones had to retract or apologize for the stories within a month after receiving Alfantis' letter requesting retractions for the false claims, lest he be subject to litigation. Jones's words have not only sparked violence, but hysteria as well. In 2015, Governor Greg Abbott set the Texas State Guard to monitor a planned US military exercise known as Jade Helm. Alex Jones claimed that the troop movements were actually a prelude to martial law, creating such a hysterical reaction that the army had to send surrogates to calm anxious citizens. 
One fact check site says that InfoWars headlines at the time read, feds preparing to invade Texas, list state as hostile. And the article itself said that a newly released military document detailed the army's plan to wage a war on the American people. And again, this was a training exercise, but it's hardly any wonder that so many members of Alec Jones' audience seem scared, paranoid, and believe that the government is out to get them. It's because Jones actively promotes that narrative. InfoWars consistently promotes that narrative. They use that fear and mistrust to sell products, gain trust, and paint themselves as the only news you can trust. Now, while I do discuss the Sandy Hook situation in depth in my previous episode dedicated just to Alex Jones and who he is, and Jones, of course, denying the horrific events that even took place, it's also worth noting that his legal team allegedly sent the Sandy Hook victim's family's CP when emailing them, and a woman that stalked one of the parents of a Sandy Hook victim was inspired by InfoWars commentary. There are far more instances of Alex Jones inspiring fear and paranoia, but these are just a few of the worst. As a result of this, Alex Jones has recently referred to as a stochastic terrorist. Mother Jones spoke to Juliette Kayem, a national security expert and former assistant secretary at the Department of Homeland Security. She defines stochastic terrorism as a method of political incitement that provokes random acts of extremist violence in which the instigator uses rhetoric ambiguous enough to give himself and his allies plausible deniability for any resulting bloodshed. This way, stochastic terrorists can say that these lone wolf shooters are quote, random nuts, end quote, and aren't held responsible. I didn't expect to have anything really good to say about Infowars to be totally honest with you, and especially not after the episode that focused on Alex Jones. However, it was interesting to take a look at InfoWars through a slightly different lens. Instead of only looking at the host, we've seen some of the people around him and the way his station operates and how it actually makes its money. And it's about what you would expect from Alex Jones on a company he would run, even though it's still quite disappointing. But with that being said, that's where we're gonna wrap up today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you learned something new today. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date with all the recent episodes. If you want to connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure to check out the links in the description box to all of my social media and other projects that I'm involved in. I wanna thank you for spending some of your valuable time here with me today. Again, I really appreciate it and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.